Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're finally getting to the fuel injection system on the Triumph TR6 project. For those of you who have been following the channel and asking me about this video, it's finally here. Now what the problem is, is I recorded the whole project as I did it on the TR6 and then I immediately went on with my other projects, working on my book and tearing apart the shop to clean it up and realized that the last half of the video I recorded was lost. I don't know if the GoPro ate it or what happened to it, but I finally got back out here, got the car back in the shop, and I can go ahead and wrap this video up. So what we're going to do is we're going to travel back in time to when I was actually working on the project and look at the footage that I already had shot, and then we'll come back to present day, and I'll go ahead and finish the rest out with more of a summary overview. So let's go talk to me in the past. Now, this is the Patton's retrofit kit. It's also so sold as the affordable EFI kit. It is essentially a throttle body retrofit that turns your carburetors into throttle body fuel injection with a relatively minimal number of complications. Now on the right we have a throttle body fuel injection system. On the left we have the carburetor still left behind. All that was required in order to convert this to a throttle body fuel injector was the removal of the top hat and the plunger and the needle and the addition of an aluminum adapter and a fuel injector. There are top hats for the kit as well, but those are off currently at powder coat. And as soon as they're back, you'll see them probably at the end of the video, finally installed. They should add a nice little accent color to under the hood. The installation of this part of the kit is super easy. Four screws, drop it in, four longer screws, you're done. The more complicated part is deciding on your wiring route to make sure that you don't run into any heat sources, adding in the fuel system, because now with a fuel injection system, we are going to have an electric fuel pump serving a lot higher fuel pressure, and we're going to need a fuel pressure regulator holding back the right amount of fuel pressure for these fuel injectors, and a return fuel line to the fuel tank. We're also going to need an assortment of sensors ranging from a throttle position sensor determining how open the throttle bodies are, to a temperature sensor, determining how the coolant temperature is currently set to adjust for what would be your choke. We also need the O2 sensor, metering the exhaust gases and deciding if the engine is running too rich or too lean. And we'll have a few others like MAP sensors and things like that to assist with load determination and probably an idle air control valve in the system to allow it to regulate the idle up or down based on the computer programming. Now, the biggest hassles in the installation of this kit will definitely be the running of the wiring and the running and plumbing of the fuel system. There's a few things that will be very different in my installation than your installation if you do this at home. I am going to be doing a PMU-16 to control all the power, so I'm doing a lot of rewiring of the engine bay, I'm deleting the factory fuse block, and I'm going to be cutting the wiring harness for the fuel system and replacing it with a auto sport connector to go through the firewall rather than a large hole in a grommet and just shoving the wiring harness through. So a lot of that will be different and it will be in this video. Additionally, I'm going to be using an aftermarket aluminum fuel tank that already has a fuel return on it. So I won't be welding on a fuel return, but I will be talking about the process and I'll have to make some custom brackets to get this fuel tank in place and it may change the way I route some of the fuel lines. Real quickly, I want to address a question that was left in the comments about carburetor spacers. Now, when we took these carbs off, these carburetor spacers were already on the intake manifold. And when we took them off, they ripped the top surface off and it was stuck to the carburetor. It made for a nightmare for my girlfriend to clean it off of there and to get these ready to be replaced. I'm going to be putting carburetor spacers back on, but these are like a nylon plastic carburetor spacer that has no surface material to be pulled off, but still form the same basic function. Now, the only reason to really have carburetor spacers is either to increase the distance that the, the runner has to the carburetor to improve fuel atomization or distribution if you're trying to gain performance, or more likely to provide a thermal barrier to prevent heat transfer into your carburetors and boiling of fuel and vapor locking of the car. Now, I don't know that either of those will actually be a problem with the fuel injection system, but by having this little spacer in there, it gives me an easier place to ensure sealing for vacuum sealing 
And anytime you can isolate heat from something that shouldn't be too warm, that's not a bad solution to go with. So I'll be putting these back into the car. Before we can drop the carburetors back in the car as throttle bodies, we need to block off these bypass plates. Now, the one on the other carburetor is in the middle of the linkage, which is more difficult to get to. But you can see on this one that we have basically six screws on the face of it. We need to install this tiny piece of metal to block it off and make it no longer functional. You only need to remove the flathead screws in order to remove the unit. If you remove the Phillips head screws, the unit itself will pop apart. Now, that's not necessarily a problem, it just makes it way more complicated. So if you only remove the flatheads, your job is a lot easier. They say you don't need a sealant, but I'll be putting some gasket sealant on here to hold the little tiny shim block off in place and to seal up any imperfections so I don't have any vacuum leaks down the road. This is the gasket, and as you can see, it was actually kind of defective from the beginning with this gap between here, allowing a constant little vacuum leak there. I don't know if that was designed into the engineering or not, but we need to get this gasket off of here and replace it with a piece of metal. Now let's do it to the other one and get this back in the car. So here you can see we have the TPS now installed. You have to take the end nut off of the linkage shaft between the carburetors, put this brass fitting in place, which screws on like a nut, is locked in place by an Allen screw, and then has a key at the end which engages your TPS. So you have to thread this on there to the right position to engage the TPS at the right position. And you may need to bend the supplied bracket to get everything aligned just right. I had to do several bends, and as you can see, it reuses the outermost two carburetor bolts, and that required tightening those, making sure they weren't going to cause this bracket to slip and adjust as I was getting everything lined up. You also don't want to fully lock this in place until you test carefully that your linkage can move completely and freely within the mechanism. If you turn your TPS mechanism too far, you can break it in one way or the other. Now that I've got all of this installed and freely moving, I've got the carburetor covers back and installed. These are now powder coated. Normally these would come as raw aluminum. And I'm going to be moving on to figuring out how to get my coolant temperature sensor put into this line so that I can read the coolant temperature for the ECU. And I'm going to begin replacing some of the included fittings with AN fittings because I won't be using brass fittings for this install. So let's get back to work.
see the solution I came up with for the coolant temperature sensor right here. I cut the existing hose, added in two 8AN adapters with an 8AN T fitting to NPT fitting, and I had to stick this adapter in here to get to the sensor. Hopefully having the sensor removed from the coolant flow path this much won't cause too much of a problem, but if it does, I'll just have to go have machined up or something, a T fitting that moves this NPT female directly into the flow. But really, since this is just controlling enrichment, it probably won't matter all that much. Now that this is buttoned up, I can go ahead and get ready to test for coolant filling and leaks and move on to fuel and vacuum. So like I said, we're going to be using AN fittings instead of these brass fittings. So here on the left, you can see a 8th NPT to 6AN adapter. And here you can see what they included, which is the 90 degree slip fitting with the 8th NPT on the other side. Now what I'm going to be doing <clears throat> is basically making most of it like this with AN fittings that can be worked on with wrenches. And we will basically be assembling a fuel rail out here that will come up from the pump, loop around and go right back to the fuel pressure regulator before diving out of the car. And it'll all be black AN fittings. I gave him the option of leaving off these crimp bands just because they don't look as aesthetically pleasing, but they will help with longevity and he'd prefer to go that route because even though the hose fits tight enough not to leak initially, as it ages, that's usually where leaks will form is as the hose dries out and widens out, it'll start to slip off, leak a little bit and usually burn cars to the ground. And since we're probably not gonna come back and rework this car for years, might as well give it the best longevity we can. So I'm gonna go ahead and dive into working on the fuel system and starting to figure out some of the vacuum system. Now that we have the front end of the car mostly wrapped up enough to start mocking things up, I need to know exactly what the fuel lines are going to look like. In order to do that, I ripped out the old fuel lines, dumped all those rusty pieces to the side, but now we need to get the fuel tank in place so I can measure and cut new fuel lines. Now this is the new fuel tank that will be going in the TR6. This is all aluminum, custom fabricated specifically for this application. And while it has all of the same basic features as the factory TR6 tank, it has the fuel filler in the same location, the vent line, and the level sender port. It also has the addition of a EFI fuel return line and two supply points. Now on the factory tank, there's a single supply hookup on the driver's side, which could lead to starvation issues and cornering if all the fuel was sloshed to the passenger side. In this case, I will be using both ports wide together to the fuel pump so that it should never have a starvation issue. That will also help gravity feed the fuel pump enough that it should ease the strain on it and keep it from burning itself out since it is an inline fuel pump. Now, in order to get this in the car, I'm going to have to make some brackets and drill some brackets. There are tabs welded to the sides, top and bottom. However, I must use some spacers to build extensions on the top to bring the tank up to where it needs to be to meet the body mounting points. And I need to drill the sides and the bottom to locate to the current factory mounting points. This is gonna take some finagling, so it's not gonna be particularly interesting time-lapse, but hopefully we can sort of skip to it being complete. So let's go ahead and start getting this put together. You probably didn't get to see a whole lot of the installation of the fuel tank because it was quite the process and I had to undo it a few times. So basically it vaguely fits in place. It does fit within the dimensions mostly, but shimming it up and getting it squared up is quite a pain. And really I would have preferred someone just take like maybe half an inch of depth out of it and then give us a better mounting mechanism. But it's in the car. 
the filler is completely set in place it all lines up everything works the two biggest problems i currently have are the wiring for the level sender don't reach because the level sender is now here instead of right here so i'm going to have to make an extension harness for these and then i need to figure out how to slip the return line up through one of the other ports as this completely covers the rubber grommets that had been used before. So I'm gonna have to go a little farther out to the side, come up, get that mounted. But since the fuel return is the longest continuous piece of rubber I'm going to be putting in there, I might as well start there and then I can patch together the supply line as I'm going. So let's get under the car and start looking for some routes to run some rubber. Here we are back in the present and you can see that everything's done on the installation. So I'm just going to run through some of the basic things that I remember from the install. Now, once I wrapped up everything on that side of the engine, I went ahead and finished the fuel system. We put the fuel tank in the back. We went ahead and ran the lines up here, put the fuel pump down below, wide the two feeds together, put the fuel filter in there. So there's a fuel filter immediately after the fuel tank and then gravity down to the fuel pump and then a small filter after that all the way up here before this essentially makeshift fuel rail where it loops through, feeds both throttle body unit, does an aggressive U-turn, comes back to the fuel pressure regulator and then returns back to the fuel tank. Now, originally I was gonna hide all of this underneath the intake manifold, but this was safer for heat and the owner wanted it to be up somewhere that it could be worked on and checked for leaks after it's been parked for long periods of time rather than trying to hide it. So I went ahead and made it as obvious as possible to check any of the fittings. And everywhere that it has a push fitting, I also clamp banded it just so that as these lines get older and begin to swell, they can't slip back or start to leak as easily. That's all 6AN fittings, so it's way more fuel than a car like this actually needs. Now on this portion of the engine, I took apart the distributor, replaced the guts with the retrofit kit that came with the system. And that was so easy, it really doesn't need much of an explanation. You basically just take the cap off, pull the rotor off, take the center bolt out, pull the guts out, and then put the new guts in and put it back together. On this distributor, it was worn enough internally that you could install the new internals backwards 180 degrees. So just keep that in mind. If you can't set the timing, that could be backwards. You may just have to pull it back up, switch it around and drop it back in. Now over here with the wiring harness that comes around from the ECU, there's a plug here that feeds up to this igniter chip essentially that is controlling the distributor or power to the distributor and everything and the coil here. That unit actually gets power just from the ECU but that doesn't power everything. You still need to pull a positive feed from somewhere else that has a full 12 volt. I pulled it right off of the original wire that was here that was feeding the distributor before. And I ended up cutting out a ton of wiring on this car because it was all terribly soldered and just corroded. So I simplified it all down and rewrapped everything when I went ahead and rewrapped it all for the electric fans and all of that. I also deleted the fuel or the fuse block here and everything related to the old fuel system because they aren't needed on this car. And in this particular case, the final installation involved a PMU-16 that got rid of all the other fuses and relays in the car. So electrical and fuel systems are basically completely different. Now, I'm sure there's people that are gonna have some specific questions that would have been nice to see in the installation video, but since I don't have that footage, just leave them in the comments and I can get back to you when I can get back to you. So let's go ahead and fire the car up and see how it runs. So I have the car currently configured to where the PMU-16 comes on as soon as you open the driver's side door. Now the PMU-16 and the ECU are located underneath the dash. And so I wired that all up in case you wanted to prime the fuel system when you open the door versus when the key comes on. From my experience with this car and this particular ECU setup, it doesn't seem to matter. It, for some reason, refires regardless. So. I would need to do some more research to make sure it was truly a big benefit. I went ahead and also repurposed the spot where the choke had been to be an override for the electric fan. So if you would want to turn on the electric fan before the thermostatic switch that's included with the kit, you can do it with that button right there. Kind of handy. I also set the electric fan to be controlled by the PMU to continue to run 
for a set amount of time after the car is turned off in case you just want it to cool down a little bit before it shuts itself down. Now the car has been sitting for quite a while, but I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot. I think the battery should be up enough to just fire it after a few cranks. Now, as you can see, the car is uh, really cold, so it's idling high, but it fired right up. It's been sitting for quite a few months on and off. I think I've come out here and fired it once or twice just to make sure that the oil moved around and the battery wasn't totally dead. But other than that, it's pretty much just been sitting and that's pretty much how it always fires up, maybe give or take one or two more cranks, depending on how cold it is in here and how like well the fuel atomizes but in general, it fires right up. Unfortunately, I can't really take it for a drive right now because it's terrible outside. So I'll go ahead and get a driving video of this car up later on, but it actually drives and responds really well. I did have an issue with the original TPS sensor that came with the kit just being somewhat defective out of the box. So if you have that problem again, it may be an ongoing problem, but really it was a generic GM sensor. So I think it was just bad luck. And it was only like 15 bucks or something to get a new one. Now, this car does respond pretty good. But obviously being cold, I'm not gonna rev the heck out of it. The overall installation was pretty straightforward. And a lot of it's custom to the way I would install it because I cut the wiring harness redid the whole wiring harness so that it could come down here to the ECU and PMU 16 that's under the dash so that that could do all the work. And I still have the wiring for the stereo laying here because it's horribly butchered and generally needs to be replaced, but nobody's really made a decision on what's happened with the stereo. So it's just laying there for right now. While I was at it, I did a few other things in here, but most of it probably doesn't apply to your car, like making sure this actually has a shift knob that doesn't just spin freely on top of here and things like that. So rather than just sit here and asphyxiate myself, I'm gonna go ahead and shut it down. There you have it. The much requested Triumph TR6 fuel injection conversion project is complete. So I'm sorry again for having lost that video. I'm just gonna blame the GoPro because I can't actually remember which camera it was that ate my homework, but that's the one that's gonna get the blame. If you have any questions about this project, please leave them in the comments down below. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.